Imagine if you could easily find solutions to make your region or city smarter, greener, better connected, more social, and closer to citizens. The InterAg Europe Policy Learning Platform can help you. Access knowledge about the latest policy trends. Discover expert validated good practices from all over Europe. Find solutions in our peer review. Get tailored support from our expert team. We can connect you with the right people and organizations. Together, we will find ways to solve your region's or city's challenges. Start your policy learning journey today. Very nice video. Thank you, uh, Lotte. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I see uh, many people have joined us. So good afternoon. Today's uh, topic webinar is going to be about uh, GovTech and the uh, digitization of the public sectors. So very, very important uh, topics, especially given the digital uh, Europe um, missions. So today we are going to uh, co-moderate this uh, webinar with Mark. I'm uh, Arnold Morrison. I'm one of the thematic experts in research and innovation. How are you, Mark, this Good afternoon? Aft Good afternoon, Arnold. Good afternoon, everyone. The one is the sun is shining, but it's cold. But uh, I guess that's a familiar story across Europe. But looking forward to the presentations and then uh, getting some questions from our participants. So. Let's rock and roll. Excellent, good idea, Mark. Um, and also we have Lotte with, with us, uh, who is going to help us uh, with uh, the technical side of things. Uh, we are very, very lucky today because we have uh, three very good uh, speakers uh, with us. We have um, Arune from uh, GovTech Lab uh, Lithuania. Are you Arune this afternoon? I'm perfect, thank you. Excellent. We also have uh, Bernhard from Lower Austria. Um, how are you, Bernhard? Thanks very well. Excellent. And also, last but not least, we have uh, Frederick with us from, from Sweden. How are you, Frederick? Hello. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And of course, we are going to see today uh, the GovTech Lab of, in Lithuania, but also two uh, very good practices, uh, one from uh, Sweden and from, from Austria. So looking at DigiContest and the e-Citizen uh, Weeks. So looking at how to involve policymakers, but also citizens uh, in uh, digitization policies. So before we move on to uh, Good practices and presentation. Uh, let me uh, let us tell you a little bit more about uh, Interreg Europe and uh, the policy learning platform. Uh, so Interreg Europe is a very unique program uh, that aims uh, to promote interregional collaboration through uh, better policies. It's very unique because it does it does that through covering all uh, European countries. Uh, all European regions and provide a combination of projects with funding and also uh, with services. So Interreg Europe in a nutshell is uh, it's all about being a, a capacity building programs to promote uh, better policies. Uh, how to do that is through the exchange of uh, experience, interregional collaboration, and uh, capacity building, and is mostly uh, dedicated to uh, policymakers and regional policymakers. And there, there, there are two uh, main actions. Uh, so the first one is uh, the projects. And here we have two great projects with us, next to met and Erudite. Uh, both projects are trying to provide, uh, deliver better policies regarding uh, digitization uh, at the regional level. Uh, the first call was closed uh, last May, but we have a second call that will be uh, open in March. And uh, the second action, the second pillar of inter Europe is the policy learning platform. And the policy learning platform is really all about capitalizing uh, all the knowledge that has been created in inter Europe and trying to diffuse uh, 
uh, this uh, knowledge to as many policymakers as uh, possible. So what we do at the policy uh, learning platform, we uh, do capacity building, support opportunities uh, through um, different ways. Uh, we diffuse uh, knowledge, we connect people, and we offer uh, expert support. And regarding the knowledge, uh, we have the good practice uh, database with a lot of good practices for you to get uh, inspired on different type of policies. Uh, we, but we also uh, do um, write uh, very nice policy briefs, stories, and so on. Uh, with Mark right now, we, we're writing a, a nice policy brief on spaces uh, for innovation. So, so stay tuned for that. Uh, regarding connecting people, uh, we have a community with uh, more than 25,000 practitioners, uh, and we provide workshops, but webinars and online discussion on a specific topics. So if you're interested to in you know, a specific topics, please let us know. And so we can uh, prepare and create a, a nice uh, webinar or a nice uh, online discussion on the topic that you're interested in. Also what we do, we have policy learning practice and here we can organize for you uh, peer reviews or matchmaking to um, address specific policy challenges that you might have in your regions. Maybe, Mark, you can tell us a little bit more about the peer reviews. Indeed, I mean, you can see from this map that we've uh, conducted peer reviews across Europe. Um, the idea is that uh, you, the host uh, of, of a peer review, has a policy challenge. It can be a, an old program that uh, isn't functioning anymore, a, a new policy initiative you want to, to work on. And um, you reach out to the policy learning platform team, uh, explaining on a very short application form, two pages, and we turn it around uh, in very quick time. There's no uh, deadlines, it's an ongoing call. So yeah, sooner, better, sooner you apply, the better. And th the idea is that you have a policy challenge, you want insights from how other regions, other practitioners have, have tackled the project. And we will work with you to find four to six peers and um, we will then bring them to your region, bring them to your event, and uh, we pay for their uh, travel, we pay for the uh, logistics around the event uh, with you. So there's you know, costs that are taken on board, translation costs we can cover, and we spend two days with you. And at the end of those two days, it isn't just, uh, well, that was nice, bye-bye, uh, and uh, hope to see you again one day. No, at the end of the two days, we leave you with a report of, of firm recommendations that, to try and address the policy challenges, the questions that you ask. So depending on who you invite, you know, your stakeholders, your uh, senior politicians, policymakers, you could actually accelerate the uh, process of adapting a policy or creating the framework for a new policy uh, quite quickly. Uh, if I just, you know, I could give you plenty of examples uh, from the map, but the best thing is to go and have a look at some of the uh, peer reviews and they're all written up. The report is published online so you can see which thematics maybe have been uh, tackled. We've de dealt with a lot of digital issues uh, from the SMEs or from the regional perspective. So it's as long as your project ch policy challenge fits within the scope of the four thematic areas of, of uh, Interreg Europe, then it will fit. So it's a very wide ranging uh, policy support tool, as, as Arnold said, capitalization. And, and perhaps the, the, the idea is that, you know, we enable you through peer reviews and other services to connect to other people and not just interreg community, but the best practice could come from another program, can come from a, a different, um, uh, you know, institution organization. Uh, Arnaud and I recently did some work with the OECD, for example. So we can bring these people and bring this knowledge to your region through this peer review and um, uh, have a look at the map. There's some very good examples. I'm sure you'll be familiar with some of the places and the themes we've, we've tackled. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. And it's an easy application, right? It's only one page, uh, super easy. And you can always uh, ask us for questions regarding peer reviews or matchmaking. Matchmaking, they are great as well because they are two hours and very targeted online and the application is very easy and you can send us also policy help desk and we will uh, gather for you good practices and from inter-europe community 
So some examples um, regarding GovTech and the digitization of the public sectors from, from Inter-Europe and uh, policy learning platform. So we have plenty of good practices. We have this uh, project called Better and here different uh, good practices regarding e-government services, um, e-services. So that can be uh, really interesting. As Mark mentioned, we have done a lot of different peer reviews. And regarding the digitization of the public sector, we did uh, three different peer reviews. One was the digitization strategy in uh, Croatia. Um, also, we did one regarding digitization of environmental procedures in Andalusia in Spain. And the last one regarding uh, smart city services in Tallinn, Estonia. So maybe Lotte, you can put some links in the chat and you can also look at the, at the reports uh, of the peer reviews there. And uh, Policy Learning Platform also wrote a very nice uh, uh, policy brief on fostering the digital transformation of SMEs. But before we delve into uh, the topic of today, we have a very short poll for you. Uh, two questions. Uh, maybe let's say, you, okay, there they are. So one, the first question is first to, to know if you are familiar with the term of GovTech. Have you ever heard of the, of the concept? And the second question is, uh, has your region implemented GovTech related policy actions? So we see people answering. So it's um, kind of a 50, 50, uh, yes and no, um, 60, 40, yes. And regarding the implementation of Gov GovTech is uh, mostly, I don't know. Okay, so 10% yes, 25% no, and uh, 67, I don't know. So you're lucky today because we are going to see what uh, GovTech is all about. And we also get to know if we can implement GovTech and how to implement GovTech at the regional le level. So GovTech, a very short slide uh, from us, very short introduction. So the term GovTech refers to the use of emerging technologies and digital products and services by government from startup and SMEs instead of relying on large system integrators. So it's basically working with SMEs and startup to uh, promote uh, digital products and services. So there are three uh, different common elements when we talk about GovTech. The first one is that the public sectors engage with startup and SMEs in doing some public procurement of innovative uh, technology solutions. Uh, it's all about the provision of tech-based products and services, and it's uh, about uh, innovating and improving public services, so e-services mostly. And we are seeing that uh, European governments are increasingly establishing GovTech programs. We are going to see one example with uh, GovTech Lithuania, but there are many different member states that uh, are starting to implement such uh, GovTech. We have Estonia and Poland and so on. And it's about delivering better policies. Uh, it's about modernizing legacy IT infrastructure and finding some solution to pressing societal challenges. I, we recommend you to have a look at this nice report, uh, GovTech Practices in the EU, uh, and I think you will find the link in the chat as well. So Mark, have you anything to add before we move on to our presentations? Just the last point you mentioned, or the penultimate point, how uh, you can link this type of approach to a, a particular challenge uh, that you would be facing, so it gives it a, a thematic focus. If you think of the commission and when it's uh, driving through its policy agenda on green transition, climate change, you can imagine a uh, sort of a coupling of the tools in a region uh, that could be aligned with the policy challenge. You know, climate change is, is, is affecting us all. So I think that's an interesting way in terms of um, conceptualizing and then putting it into an operational framework by giving it a, a thematic focus. So, we will be asking the, uh, the various speakers uh, their views on these matters. And already, and I think you know, Arnaud mentioned it, and, and Lotta has been putting stuff in the chat. Use that to ask some questions during the speaker presentations, and we will, we will, we will use them. We'd rather take your questions uh, than ask our own questions. So. Yes, please, participants, uh, use the chat. We want to make it as interactive as possible. So when you have any any questions, but I've seen the chat very active, Mark. So that's that's a good thing. 
Um, let's move on to see, to learn a little bit more about GovTech uh, Lithuania. What is it all about? Uh, Arone, the floor is yours. And uh, you have uh, 10 minutes uh, for, for your presentation. Perfect. Uh, so thank you. Thanks a lot for having me here. And it's great that GovTech topic is definitely becoming more widespread and interesting to many people. So my name is Aruna. I'm the manager of the GovTech Club in Lithuania, and we are part of our main uh, government innovation agency. And I'll talk a bit about, in general, GovTech, what, what is and how we in GovTech in Lithuania engage with the topic. So I'd like to start with some context because uh, Lithuania, as many other countries in uh, Europe, in the EU, like Estonia, for instance, are already quite strong digital nations. You know, we have most of the public services digitized and so on. So why would you need to you know, engage with these new tech terms even? But the fact is that um, the change in technology is moving very fast. There is increasingly more and more affordable technologies open to the public sector. And the citizens' expectations are increasing as well. So we see that citizens are getting used to uh, the services provided uh, by various, for instance, startups uh, or like Uber or you know, ordering food online. And they expect similar kind of uh, similar kind of experience service from the public sector. You know, and it's not just the digital service or analog service that's put that is put on digital the same form. They expect something where they don't need to think about the service and they get it. And the, the questions that we ask is how we can bring this constant force of innovation that we see, for instance, in the startup world and the SME world into the public sector. Because the challenge is that the way the public sector is structured is usually not geared towards much innovation. It's usually geared toward, towards more stability, you know, ensuring the consistency of public services. But how can we actually, you know, uh, still engage with, with that force of innovation. And what we found that the answer is, is kind of creating space for exploratory innovation. So in our day-to-day -day lives as a public servants, we might, you know, do more step-by-step -step innovation, but we need to engage in this completely outside the box uh, innovation. And the way to do it is to actually, um, you know, engage with skills, expertise, and ideas for, from entrepreneurs, uh, because, in the public sector, we're, we're not alone. We're working together with the, both uh, civil society, but also entrepreneurial society. And we can kind of, in a way, using the more old school words, outsource some of the, you know, that exploratory innovation from the entrepreneurial world. And this is for us where we started our conversation about GovTech and what kind of GovTech is. And I think that it's easier, easiest to explain GovTech in two different graphs. So on the one hand, it's this kind of, merge between various public sector areas from mobility to public services, healthcare, and so on, and then technology. So from more advanced like artificial intelligence or virtual reality to more sometimes even basic algorithms. Uh, but usually when we talk about GovTech, it's more of these emerging technologies, not just simple digitalization. And similarly, it is not just about technology and the public sector, but it's also about this co-creation and interaction between the creators of innovation, the startups, companies, academia, and so on, and the public sector. And the interaction that kind of constantly goes uh, both ways, because otherwise, you know, why would we need this? If it's just about digitalization and there's no co-creation interaction, why do we need this new term called GovTech? We can just continue talking about uh, usual digital government practices. So uh, given, given all this, that's why in 2019, we decided to set up a GovTech club in Lithuania. We decided that we need this team within the public sector that as, acts as a facilitator, as a translator between the public sector world and the startup world. So we build a team that focus on, focuses on three core kind of pillars of activities. First, kind of helping solve GovTech challenges for the public sector, you know, coordinating this challenge solving. The second one is building GovTech's ecosystem and community, because we know, of course, now it's growing, but especially when we started, very few people, you know, even engage with this and, you know, to achieve the 
impact, you have to have a broader community for that. And finally, increasing public sector innovation skills. So ensuring that public sector organizations themselves are able to kind of undertake this uh, exploration of innovation. While many of these actually activities can uh, uh, kind of correspond with what other organizations are doing, I think the one that it's the most uh, innovative and the one that mirrors similar programs in the EU and beyond is what we call our GovTech Challenge Series. In short, GovTech Challenge Series is a four-stage process, how we move from having a complex challenge in the public sector into having a prototype solution that answers that challenge. We, we start this, uh, this process by first selecting and defining challenges from the public sector, then taking the best of them transforming into understandable language and then putting it out to the market for startups and SMEs, not to just fulfill the technical specification, but to actually propose ideas of how to solve a challenge. Once we have the challenge, we have the, the team and the best idea, we put them together into this pilot development stage, again, ensuring that it's not just kind of your usual contractor supplier relationship, but there's that like structured co-creation where you actually uh, meaningfully engage the public sector and the startup together to build the, the solution and usually the prototype solution. And the, five, the, the fourth stage is um, actually presenting these solutions, looking what can be scaled, if it's answer the challenge that, was, uh, that we began with, or it maybe showed additional problems or it showed that the problem is actually in a different stage. So we actually, since 2019, we ran five iterations of this. Each iteration has a number of challenges ranging between three to 37. Overall, we had, um, I'm gonna go through a bit more statistics, but uh, 70 plus challenges over the past three years. To kind of give more context, what kind of challenges we're talking about usually, we don't take the challenge that is very broad. Uh, we take the challenge that has a very specific owner. So for instance, we worked with communications regulatory authority in Lithuania, who is responsible for safe internet in Lithuania. And their challenge was how to actually automate detecting some of the illegal content and children uh, abuse content online uh, so that it's not a person or people that has to do it, but, it, but it's kind of a web crawler uh, that can undertake this task. And then people can meaningfully focus on actually bringing these cases to the police. And they worked through our program with startup OxyLab that created this AI-based web crawler to do that. And it's already being piloted in the organization. Uh, for a completely different challenge, we worked with Lithuania's Ministry on, uh, of Environment and then the startup Coetus that they were creating a tool that using satellite data, understand all the forest, the, the structure of the forest in Lithuania and monitor it, how it's changing. Is someone cutting it illegally or not? Is it everything according to the permits? And actually the final example, our first challenge with the Bank of Lithuania was how to make sure that for market participants or fintechs and banks, there's less regulatory burden to report all the data, but all, many of the data could be taken automatically from them. So Columbus and Peak Data combined created this um, kind of API, which could help share data between the, uh, the regulator and the market uh, participants. Uh, and finally, some statistics. So overall, over the past three years and five iterations of this program, we had 278 challenges submitted, 70 challenges, 72 challenges were selected and went through our program. And they were from 51 organizations. So some of the organizations repeated. The challenges were the, the spectrum it were quite broad. Most of them were about more efficient operations. Um, so making sure that you know internally that the we use AI where it's possible to um, or just kind of uh, um, just more advanced algorithms. Many of them were for increasing better services for for making services better for businesses and citizens. And so the like a smallest part was about data-driven policymaking. So making sure that the uh, policymakers have better tools to collect data and then make decisions in terms of policy. 
what we're planning next, next is together with other European countries participating in the EU GovTech incubator and making this kind of process um, more on a kind of piloting it on a European level. What if we have challenges at the same time with different countries? Uh, what we're also trying to do is have more challenges via public procurement. So we found this procurement method called design contest that's very suitable for that. But uh, not all public sector organizations actually assign money for, procure for experimental procurement. So we try to you know, help doing that and motivate them. And finally, focusing more on skills, not just on our GovTech Challenge Series program, but making sure that other organizations can run these kind of programs themselves, uh, because we believe that's the best way of, of scaling and increasing the number of challenges that we're helping to solve. So thanks a lot. Uh, hopefully that provides more insights into how we operate and looking forward to your questions. All right. Thanks, Aruna. Uh, very uh, tempting appetizer. I mean, I've got tens of questions, but I'm not going to monopolize. So um, I, I've got some questions I'll ask you, but don't forget, audience, put them in the chat and then we can we respond to them. But the first one I think is would help everybody is to, to this is a sort of national level initiative are you able to give us some idea of the annual resources the budget that you and the, and the staffing level of this uh you know lab because it can be uh 50 people it can be 10 people um because i think that would give people an idea of the scale what, what's what's the uh yeah. your answer so we are five people overall mm -hmm. and we actually work with public sector organization across all of Lithuania. So uh, municipalities, uh, like agencies, ministerial level, any kind of level. And the, uh, when we manage to do it through public for procurement, so for instance, the challenges, like the experiments they usually work with, they're usually around 50,000 euros. So it's something where you know, you can get enough to get the prototypes to check your hypothesis, but you're not wasting money and spending billions of like IT systems that you don't know are going to work. Yeah, okay. No, I think that's good because we often have that question. Well, are they, does it need 50 people to run this initiative? Five is, 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 is a lean machine. Uh, you know, the, the results you've generated is, is impressive. In, in terms of your, um, experience now at the national level are there any particular aspects you think you should raise awareness of if we were looking at that at a, at a regional level you know do you need certain critical mass does it work at uh, uh you know is it just like say scale it down or what what's your view on on the context for a regional deployment of such initiative yeah, I think it, when you look at it, probably the size of Lithuania is smaller than some of the regions. True, if we get to Europe. Bavaria, Bavaria is probably a bit bigger than there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I think, I think to be honest, this is actually where GovTech really flourishes, you know, because uh, we know that we're not able to have like, huge <clears throat> agencies with like the top uh, like programmers that build the solutions for us. Mm -hmm. We know that there are you know, in the regions and smaller countries, they're usually smaller organizations that have maybe less resources for innovation. And that allows us, you know, maybe more organically even for GovTech approach to flourish because you have to be more open to outside ideas, to entrepreneurial ideas. So I think this is like, I, I don't know, I think it's even like better uh, platform in a way for, for GovTech to flourish because of the, like kind of the s structure or the scope of it, but also because it's, uh, closer to to the people. So if you want to, you know, you you you're taking this approach and you're using these processes to make sure that your services in the end are more appropriate for citizens' expectations. And usually, cities and regions are closer to to the people and can actually yes. test it out easier. So I think mm. um, this is why like it's it's very much appropriate. I think even mm. suggested for. For cities or regions. Mm. Yeah, I think the other speakers that will follow you will, will demonstrate at a, uh, that level. To to the um, to the imagine you're starting with a blank piece of paper uh, and you've got the existing policy framework, whether it's an economic strategy or whether it's a, a you know a public uh, uh, sector deployment strategy. Well, where does the main uh, focus lie? Uh, would you imagine your you're in a region X and you're giving them an advice, would you place this type of initiative in the innovation uh, uh, department, in the regional development, or in uh, uh, 
corporate services because it's, as you rightly said, it's tackling many different uh, uh, policy uh, priorities, whether it's health, climate change, you know, delivery of social service. Where would you put the initiative? Where would it sit and you get the sort of ability to interact across uh, different uh, thematic policy areas? Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, practically, usually, like uh, for us, at least, it was where we could find resources to place our idea. But in theory, like we ourselves at the beginning, we kind of maybe we lied a bit to ourselves that we equally part of like innovating public sector and equally uh, encouraging SMEs and entrepreneurship. But we actually discovered throughout the years that our focus, although it kind of has unintended consequences of helping others, our focus is a bit more on that like innovation and public sector innovation side, because when we focus on that, we know that then public servants will be able then in the end to, you know, buy innovative products, which then in turn kind of create more opportunities for entrepreneurs to build it. So that's why at least um, in Lithuania, we kind of put a bit more into the innovation and specifically like public sector innovation part, because we believe that the others will more naturally follow if, follow. if there is this uh, uh. demand. Uh, well, well, on that theme, we have a question in the chat from Kimo, uh, and he, he talks, he's asking about the, the role or the engagement of citizens in the, some of the choices uh, or the design of services. Um, uh, how is that engagement uh, process work with you if we just stick with the citizen uh, idea? Yeah. Uh, so not uh, not as much as we would like to, but from the challenge bit, for us, it's necessary that public <coughs> sector organizations submit it because then they feel the ownership of it. Because if it's submitted from outside, sometimes then they don't want to solve it. But then throughout the challenge definition phase, before we go out into like actually like um, finding these best ideas and to understanding where the problem is, this is where mostly we include the the, the citizens or any kind of stakeholders is it like internal uh, external to understand the the scope of the of the challenge to understand where actually the pain points are um yeah and then well we always want to know it not always happens in terms of like when iterating and testing uh including it as well mm. so i think the challenge definition and then the testing it it's uh, essential of course like as much mm. like the more the, the, the more the, the better but the, mm. sometimes yeah, resources are, are limited for that. Okay, well, uh, thanks, Kimo, for the question. So, uh, others participate, you can uh, uh, also ask. I've got one last question before we move to the, the next speaker, and you, you put it on the, the last slide, so I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned it because otherwise my question would have seemed a bit alien to you. But it's the role of public procurement, uh, and I think we're seeing a, a, an important sort of shift uh, in uh, the mentality of, of public procurement. You know, they're very conservative uh, people normally uh, constrained by the legislation, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the regulations for, for public procurement. And we're seeing the commission launch, uh, whether it's uh, innovative public procurement as a sort of a, a banner or pre-commercial procurement, which I think some of the things you were describing, I got the feeling it was pre-commercial procurement because you're doing some research with uh, maybe a group of preferred suppliers um, you know, a group, small group of you know, the process of selecting is, is reduced, but two or three uh, SMEs, uh, innovative service providers to find how you can, you know, collectively design the best uh, service that then can be procured at a different scale. I, I, are you doing anything actively with the public procurement community to, to make sure at the end of this process, the challenges don't just uh, sit on the shelf? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think it's usually not really the public procurement regulation, but it's the habits that we formed around that and the <clears> extra <throat> uh, burden that we put on ourselves just in case someone like an audit comes in and, and yep, they think exactly. it's not right, not necessarily that the rules are wrong. Mm. So what we did is actually because with GovTech, the challenge is that most of it is like digital innovation. Mm. And sometimes with pre-commercial procurement, there's a burden of proof of this research and like uh, experimentation, which it's uh, questionable with digital tools, but we, what we found and what we tried to encourage use, it's a procurement method called design contest, which is usually used for architecture and design, but it's actually very suitable for innovation because you kind of open up 
a specific you know uh challenge mm -hmm. and then you look for awesome. ideas mm -hmm. yeah um so so that's what we tried to do and we saw that the the procurement uh, itself it's usually the least of the of the challenges the more of a challenge is actually convincing that there's a value of experimenting into encourage like making sure that you know you're buying experimentation and like prototypes not the final solution and sometimes this is more of a challenge to understand that maybe you won't get the you know the answer that you want because there's like the tech solution doesn't work for this particular yeah. challenge uh, so this has been more of a challenge than the actual procurement process, process. because yeah procurement people usually like are capable of uh, of do of doing it uh it's more everything around that and please buy your optimism <laughs> Good. All right. Okay. Arno, yes, I was just about to say back to you. So good time. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Arune. Stay with us because our good practices are going to, we are going to see how to engage policymakers and how to engage uh, citizens also in digital services. So very interesting uh, to you as well. So let's move on to uh, Lower Austria. Uh, Bernard, uh, you also have 10 minutes and, uh, and the floor is, uh, is yours. Thanks a lot. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And yeah, thanks for having me he here today. Um, I'm happy to share some insights about uh, the digitalization in Lower Austria, especially when it comes to uh, engagement of our public servants here. Um, so my name is Bernhard Gerhatter and I'm part of the unit of technology and digitalization, which is in the department of uh, economy. And uh, we act as an, an unit where we support the different and many uh, departments in our regional government. And we are also uh, connected to local universities and, and, and companies. So we are here to, to connect those, those areas. And here today, um, we tried with this um, project, with the Digi Contest, to, yeah, to, to uh, get innovative ideas um, and to engage also uh, the public uh, servants to think about digitalization, to rethink um, current processes also. And uh, the idea is here um, to, to really uh, get ideas, involve them also then when they're when they're selected as a good idea, and then also roll it out as an an example in the in the government or in the in the region where they are working. Um, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the framework, how this uh, is done. So we first did it in two thousand and nineteen. And now at the moment we run it the second time because we uh, got a lot of very positive feedback. We also saw that we got out some very nice project out of this. That's why we do it now a, a second time. Um, when we started this in 2019, it was also uh, based on our digitalization strategy. And here we say, um, we say that we'd like to mobilize, initiate and coordinate also when it comes to the, um, to the public sector also internally. And um, that's why uh, we tried this way of, of engagement. It was the first time that we uh, called all our um, employees to, uh, to submit ideas. And um, it was supported by the, the head of our, uh, of our region, by the governor, and also by the director uh, of our provincial office. So it was uh, really backed up by the highest uh, uh, persons in the region. And the ideally way was that we um, also get uh, ideas from different departments. So when it comes uh, to um, health, when it comes to road services, when it comes to uh, uh, other internal services from kindergartens to economy, uh, to statistics, we asked all of them to, to get, uh, uh, to be part of this process and to submit ideas. Um, there were some conditions which you can uh, see here. Um, all ideas which were submitted must be within the area of the responsibility of, of our government. 
and um, it was also possible that someone um, uh, 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 submitted an idea which was not his responsibility but a general idea and then the process was that all the submitted ideas were identified by a jury and then um, also some of the ideas we had uh, at, at the end, um, four uh, kind of winners, and then they were um, uh, prioritized and implemented. How this worked in details, I'd like to show it to, new, to you now, um, starting with um, some goals which we had in mind. Um, so as we are in a in a way of uh, of digitalization, also the, the 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 ways how we work in our public sector, we tried to mobilize and to get get the employees uh, in the thinking of digitalization and the rethinking of the processes, I identify really the, the core problems also, and then maybe find uh, new ways how it could be done as service for the citizens or uh, internal services uh, for, for the public sector. Um, and we also wanted to uh, position um, um, us as a very innovative um, uh, government so that they, the employees also feel proud after we implemented uh, some of the ideas. Um, we also wanted to uh, explore new ways how we can work in a cre creative way. Um, for example, when we did also some workshops uh, supporting them with finding ideas. And when, when we look at some numbers from 2019, um, we can. We were very happy because we we did not know um, how how uh, this was was uh, um, yeah received by by all of our employees. So we had uh, more than four hundred people which were interested in the in the application, which they they uh, at least started the application and and then uh, tried to to submit it but at the end um, we had um, about 80 real really nice projects which were submitted which were not just headlines but we were also already asking some very detailed question also about how this uh, imp uh, uh, can can uh, be done who should be involved do you think there, there, it, it's, it's very fast implementation or maybe smaller? So most of the projects which were submitted already had contact uh, with, with other people in the organization to really get some information out of this. And, and then we had um, um, 16 at the end nominated projects, which were in uh, four different areas. Um, so it was about digital work, it was the health sector and then also how we can use data in a very intelligent way. And then it was also a general topic which was called technology for, for change. And at the end, we uh, based on uh, jury, um, we had four, four winners which came from electric zoning planning to uh, micro apps, which is a, a kind of backbone uh, system for different ways how we can uh, start new um, apps for different uh, departments, but also other things like in the veterinary activities. And for example, um, these veterinary activities, um, they, they need to to do some, some checks at the farmers' uh, houses. These were very uh, successful, for example, also, and was is now rolled out in all other states of, of Austria because this was, was very successful then um, um, launched in, in Lower Austria. And it's, it was a very special uh, way when we announced the winners because we try to give them really a, a space where they can show what, what they did. And it was recognized by all of the top management of, of the regional government. So it was kind of like an, yeah, a little bit like an Oscar-like ceremony because they also had some short introduction videos where they show it in a very creative way, their idea. And now, because it was successfully, we decided to, to make another uh, digitalization uh, contest and it's it's running since a few days 
and with the same or similar uh, main questions when it comes to internal processes and um, when it comes to services uh, for citizens. And uh, we tried this time to even give more um, ways and options to, to prepare their projects already. To rethink, um, um, uh, we also created an idea gener uh, generator, which I ask you as an employee different questions. And uh, uh, based on these questions, you should rethink your processes and processes also of the, of the uh, uh, public in general. And there you get uh, then uh, maybe some new ideas. Um, we also partnered up with a local university um, where we have some innovation workshops, which we which we offer, and here we also uh, think it's a good chance that uh, people from different departments can join these workshops to really uh, create new ideas and and to think uh, uh, out yeah outside the box because the, sometimes it's so focused on their own department. So that's why we like to use this format as well and of course we offer also some some web session where they can ask some questions and like last time we have the same steps in these projects um, they can submit their ideas and then it's the phase where they where they get prepared also for the presentation before the jury and here we also like to um, coach them. Um, all the, the 16 nominated projects get the coaching uh, from uh, external uh, people so that they learn how to, to really get to the point of the idea, how to uh, present it in a very creative and a good way. And then at the end, uh, we will have an award uh, ceremony again with the governor and, and uh, like a, 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 a nice event. And then, of course, it, the best uh, ideas get uh, um, uh, a priority when implementing. And we have a, also a jury, which is really broad. Um, when it comes to uh, IT, we have someone there from, from, the, uh, from the different departments, also from state agency, but also from the uh, main uh, office uh, of our regional government. And looking back, what was the impact of this? So um, we were able to build up new uh, know-how in many departments, also when it comes to presentation skills. And um, we had uh, also good feedback when it comes that they know now more people from other departments. So it's easier for, for them when they start projects to reach out to them. And of course, it's an, an, a way also to to, to use this vehicle Digi contest to promote uh, ideas maybe which would normally have uh, taken longer, uh, but the Digi contest gave, gave, the, gave it like a speed train to implement this uh, idea. And one last number um, we had here, it's mostly in German, um, but we had, uh, we are tackling, we tackled about 40, 40,000 public servants um, because it's including everyone. But uh, we were very happy about that. We really get some very nice ideas out of this and maybe also interesting. Um, we tried to, to, uh, to reach very uh, many uh, or to many departments and that was all also possible so we also get ideas from kindergartens and 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 other departments yeah that was was uh, a little bit insight in this digitalization context um, if you'd like to get more information uh, we have some links here and maybe they're also in the chat and it was also part of uh, interact yet interact europe next to met um uh, which where we have had this as a, a, a good practice and yes i'm very happy to share some to answer some questions excellent uh, thank you bernard uh, can you hear me okay yes good um you're right uh, in saying that some of the links you've mentioned have been put on the discussion so uh, same again if any of our participants want to ask a question, put it in the uh, discussion slash chat and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure Bernard gets the question. A um, couple of comments from, from, from my side. I think you highlighted one of the good practices that uh, Arnaud alluded to 
in his you know, kickoff um, slides, uh, the importance of having senior executive level support. And, uh, uh, you know, it's on the invitation, it's the first thing you mentioned, so I think you've recognized it. How easy or difficult was it was to sort of uh, raise the awareness? Did you have to sort of, uh, was, there, was a time lag between this idea popping up in the bubble in someone's office in the head and then saying, uh, you know, let's do this and let's get our, uh, uh, you know, the head of the executive, the head of the regional governor to um to, to sign up to it. You got any insights into this process? Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, it's so important to have it really backed up with with uh, with uh, the, the highest uh, people. And in in our situation, it was we launched a digitalization strategy in two thousand eight. Teen around and it was uh, our unit was newly set up um, uh, in a year before this digitalization context so contest so we were in the happy position that new innovative ways were very welcomed by the uh, by the uh, decision makers <clears throat> so we uh, we told them our ideas and and happily we got we got uh, a backup from them and also very nice support and when when you as an employee get an invitation for this and um uh, these decision makers say please go for it and 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 submit your ideas i think that's uh, very important for uh, for this kind of 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 uh, projects yeah it certainly gives it visibility because you take it through to the uh, to the award ceremony where i guess yeah, yeah the regional and, governor hands and, over the prize. Yeah, and maybe one more comment. What we also see and what we now also do, communication is a very, very important uh, point in this uh, in this area. So we try to really offer communication packages, which is not us usual for 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 projects <coughs> in the in the in the government. Mm. So often internally, when we mm. really speak internally. Okay. In terms of the project implementation, uh, you know, you've, you've just told us you've launched uh, the second uh, contest. Uh, has anything changed, uh, significantly changed between your round one and your round two, the sort of what we call the lessons learned you would um, share with us? Yes, what we see is that we really have now also a focus on this uh, preparation uh, phase before they submit mm. the idea mm. that we really also uh, see uh, or, or can help them to 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 identify if projects are already there somewhere in mm. the in the in the government maybe in a, in a department and or to connect also people which have have similar ideas and also to really go to, to try to really deep dive into a problem and and rethink the mm. pro uh, process before they just copy an analog process and copy it to a digital one. Mm -hmm. And the, the another aspect is um, when we have now the the, the winners. Um, we had we had four winners, but at the end, 16 projects, which we tried to monitor. Um, what we now will do also, um, we will have, uh, we, we, we also like to support more uh, these other 12 projects after uh, this uh, process um, uh, to really also make it also possible for them to really uh, launch uh, mm. those ideas. Yeah, I mean that, that's a good point because it's, it's like it's not winner takes all. Exactly. It's, yeah. uh, you know, it's a, there's a different path for those other other projects. And, and what about the sort of the IT development cost? Because somebody can have a great idea to do something. Uh, what if they don't come from a, an IT or a solution uh, based approach, but you know, say, well, this is how we can do it? How how is that part tackled? Do they have to provide that solution uh, when they submit, or is it the, the next stage of Terms of implementation. First, it's really about the the idea itself, how it's been realized with mm -hmm. an uh, with an software. It's the it's the next stage, and there we also uh, involve uh, our IT department. And depending on on the projects, um, we we also have external um, partners helping us. Mm -hmm. But first, it's really uh, the idea. Idea. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And perhaps you can we deal with this uh, later because. The Arnolds now, now come back. You, the the criteria that the, the, the jury has for for selecting, um, maybe we can. Uh, tackle um, that. 
Yes, and um, we have some four, it's four pillars. So um, the, the questions are, um, for example, where is the benefit for the citizens? That's mm -hmm. one point. Then where is the benefit for the lower Austrian uh, provincial service? Mm -hmm. Um, and then also already, what is the ratio of benefits to costs? So it's not so easy to to have this uh, uh, question for the jury, but uh, to to really see it, and and also um, how high is the degree of of innovation, of course. I'm mm. um, still so those four areas mm. with with okay. like to to focus. Okay, um, unless I missed them, Arnaud or Lotte, I didn't see any direct questions. No question, Mark. Uh, uh, no direct question. I think we can move on to our last, uh, yeah, but not least, uh, speaker, Frederick yeah. from Sweden. And now we're going to look thanks at to, all two. Yeah, thanks to Bernard for asking the, answering thanks. the questions clearly. Yeah, Thank thanks you. so much. Yeah. And now we're going to see how to engage um, citizens, <clears> um, <throat> from public servant to, to a citizen civil society. So, Frederick, the, the floor is yours and you have 10 minutes as well. Microphone. Yes, we cannot hear you, but we can see the, the presentation is, uh, is good. Okay. Now we can see yourself, okay. So can you see my presentation now? We can we can see you, but we cannot see your presentation though. Let's try again. Let's try again. And now we can see it full screen mode. Perfect. Perfect. Well, as, as I was saying, I'm very happy to uh, hear Bernard talking about communication because that's my occupation. I work as a communications officer at the region uh, of Western Norland in Sweden right now. I have worked earlier with uh, communication in the Association of Local Authorities, uh, which is the kind of a project hub for the municipalities in the region. Uh, and I worked with different digitization projects with the communication. So I still have some knowledge, uh, maybe not so much about uh, pro programming interfaces and such, but uh, how we conducted these uh, projects in Sweden. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, eCitizen Week and what we did in the Erudite project, uh, and uh, also in collaboration with the eCollaboration project. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the region I work in. Uh, it's a relatively small region with 245,000 uh, in population. It's quite sparsely uh, populated. It's uh, 11 uh, citizens per square kilometer. And there is seven municipalities in, in this region. Uh, the biggest city which I live in is Sundsvall with uh, quite under 100,000, 99 actually. So the E-Citizen Week is a national initiative. Uh, the initiative came from the DigiDeal network in 2014 and has been running since. Uh, it's a national campaign week to increase digital participation and the use of e-services uh, with a focus on uh, the public sector. Uh, the campaign consists of local and, and regional and national efforts uh, and activities, and all activities are financed locally. So why did we participate in the e-Citizen Week? Uh, well, we saw it as an as a opportunity to increase the use and knowledge of the e-services uh, in the public sector. Also, uh, we saw it as an opportunity to create dialogue between the e-service developers and end users. And in the end, it's uh, to increase digital participation in society among citizens. It's a goal. And like I said, uh, we had 
two different projects going at the same time. Uh, we had the e-collaboration project, which had the goal to create 100 common e-services in the municipalities. And uh, those e-services were in different areas like social, uh, social services, everything from that to school bus applications for, for pupils in the schools. Uh, another goal with that project was to develop a long-term partnership in digitizing the municipalities' services. So they actually have a, a digitization council with the, the IT managers uh, running small and, and big projects together. And uh, in Erudite, we had uh, the goal to use open innovation process to decide which e-services to create. Uh, and also we did uh, an analysis of, of the possible effects that these e-services achieved in the end. So these two projects were running at the same time and we had great exchange uh, with each other. Yeah, and the target groups for the e-citizen week uh, the e-citizen week have targeted different target groups. And uh, we, we have seen that uh, participants with other languages than Swedish is increasing uh, in the country and, and, and it is at this week as participants. So, uh, and one of our target groups also was the elderly people in society. And at these uh, venues, we have had uh, interpreters that have uh, assisted to, to give support to different languages. And the background to why we wanted to target the elderly was uh, we have this uh, annually survey of uh, internet habits of the Swedish people called the Swedes and the internet. And it reveals how the use of the internet is developing and the level of digitization in society. It's published by this Swedish Internet Foundation, uh, which is an independent private foundation that works for positive development of the internet. Uh, as we uh, looked at the results uh, back in, I think it was 2017, uh, and it still is the same actually, the very oldest people in society are still the group that uses the internet the least of all, uh, although they have increased the use of digital services in the last years. And they're mostly limited by high costs, uh, computers, broadband and such. Uh, they think it's a complicated technology uh, with bank identification and such things. And they're also concerned about being scammed online and are a little bit afraid of, of the internet. So we saw the senior day at the E-Citizen Week as a bridge to, for this uh, target group to gain some knowledge. So we participated at a venue in the Sundsvall library. Uh, we had about um, 60 to 70 participants at our lectures from senior organizations. Uh, so we had open lectures on the public e-services that were available in the municipality, show them how to use them and such. Uh, and like I said, the invitation was sent out to, to senior organizations in the region. Uh, we also informed about, uh, we gave information to, to the people about the e-collaboration project and Erudite project. Uh, the, the project has also attended this e-citizen week later on and has been giving feedback on services that were created since the last time we were attending. So I, I think we have, uh, uh, we, we did an information uh, about the service of uh, consent to vaccination for, for uh, school children. Uh, earlier this was obtained through paper forms, but the digital solution allowed us for customized information, information in, in different languages, languages. So we kind of have given some feedback on, on our services to the senior organizations also. 
the potential for learning uh, through these two projects we, we did, I think uh, the most important thing is to organize networks uh, to create platforms for support for different groups. And uh, this is both for new online users and for the experience who want to make better use of the ever increasing supply of public and other e-services. And in the end, the, the ability to use the internet and search for information from authorities and such uh, is an important, important uh, democratic issue, we think. I could talk uh, for half an hour about the e-collaboration project, but uh, this was it. This was my presentation. So if you have any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. Mark, you, I think you muted. I was. Yeah. Hopefully I'm no longer. I double clicked myself. Um, as you mentioned, uh, you're part of the Erudite uh, partnership. Just wondering what, uh, um, what type of feedback did you get when you presented this project to the other partners in, uh, you know, we, we, from Erudite? Because there there's a sort of community of uh, you know, interreg regions and partners who've, who've looked at these issues of, of digital. So I was just interested if uh, were there any, uh, uh, you know, remarks of, as you say, oh, uh, in, you know, Nièvre Numérique, for example, I think, you know, they were part of the partnerships in, in the digital projects we work with. Are there any, any specific feedbacks that you got when you were presenting as part of the sort of project delivery of Erudite? Uh, I think the feedback we got was mainly that we had had a thorough organization for, for developing e-services. Mm. I mean, in Sweden, we, we waited and waited for the national authorities to create e-services for the municipality on mm. the municipality level that were common for, for all Sweden, but that didn't happen <clears throat> in the mid, mid tens. Uh, so around 2014, the municipalities in, in uh, Western Norland said, let's do this ourselves. So all the, the e-services are also created in an open uh, platform with open code so that other mun municipalities in Sweden can use the same with some adaption uh, in their systems. So I think that's the feedback we, we mostly got. The, uh, regarding to the Erudite project, I think uh, we, we had a lot of interest in the analysis of the e-services that we did within uh, the Erudite project. Uh, the results of that analysis uh, was uh, greatly asked for. And it's published, I think, in, in English and Swedish. Okay, good. And the, I think we analyzed mm, 30 or some e-services. That's published on the, Erudite, on the Erudite yeah. uh, Interreg Europe page. That's results. Mm. Okay. The, the other question I, I had is, you know, you, you mentioned the focus on, on, on the elderly. Um, is there a sort of plan in, to have a sort of a, each year a, a thematic focus? Uh, and if so, how are those uh, priorities that decided or, or, or reviewed? Uh, do you mean at this uh, EC this week or? Yeah, I mean, that was, a, that was the sort of, you know, you gave the focus on the yeah, barriers they uh, face. Uh, I yeah. can't really answer that because I'm no longer in that organization. Yeah. I work with digitization to some part, but mm. I think the e-citizen week is still running. And um, mm. I mean, the senior uh, part of, of the population is always a target, I think, when it comes to mm. using e-services and mm. being able to search information on the internet. Uh, that's a top democratic question, I think, for mm. for the democracy. Yeah, we saw in, in, in another event, Arno and I are, uh, organized, uh, where the city uh, uh, of Arad in, in Romania used a, a range of digital services to engage with the, the, the younger population. Uh, so, uh, have you had any uh, exchanges with, with uh, that you know, part of the population? Uh, I've, I think so with the for instance, the service of uh, school uh, 
school mm -hmm. bus applications. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the the parents for of children, but I don't maybe not so much the youth. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. I think where the elderly um, they, they tend to score well is as you said when there's a public meeting, the average age in the room is 60 plus, and uh, so we have. When there's a bit of paper and some presentations and you, people they, they're they much more comfortable but it, finding the different uh, routes for different parts of society to deliver you know um, sort of e-government for well people who hopefully can vote but also um you know, they, they, the, the, the impact is, is different and the levers are different for the for the younger population yeah, yeah the the user interface i, I know we have uh, tested on on in the university here I think, mm -hmm. the mid university mm -hmm. and uh, on on different groups mm -hmm. but i'm not sure about the, the e-services usually the municipalities just make e-services of of the services they normally have on paper or the old services manually. yes <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. no questions asked just put it out mm -hmm. which can be a problem i mean you should always listen to the younger people also they mm. will use it longer than we in theory in theory yeah. okay all right um uh, thanks for those the feedback for today Arnaud, aren't we should we shift into our next block let's move to our <coughs> next block uh, thank you so much Frederick, for your presentation thanks mark again for for questions so i would ask all the speakers to Turn on their camera and also their microphone so we can hear each other. So this is this part is really structured discussion. So Mark will ask you uh, questions. Hopefully, um, would be great to have some questions from the audience as well. If you want to ask either one speaker or so all the different speakers, please uh, you can use uh, the the chat at uh, at any any point. Mark. I leave yeah. you the floor with questions, and yeah. uh, we have 15, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Arnaud. The idea here is that we ask a, a question, hopefully all three of you can give some uh, different insight and answer to. So um, that's the sort of the rules of the engagement. Um, firstly, you know, we, we've, we've all of you have presented and given some insights into the sort of the positive uh, elements. If each of you were, had to give a, uh, a main barrier that uh, either impact on the implementation of the, the, the initiative or implementation post initiatives, you know, if we take the example of Bernardine and you've got these winners, you know, what's happened since uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, Lithuanian GovTech, you know, what, what barriers have, have you faced in, in implementing? So that, that question to, to all, all three of you and we can start, if you don't mind, with uh, Aruna first, because it's a long time since we've heard from you. So well, if you were to sort of put down on paper the one or two barriers that you think are particularly challenging and need to be shared with others. And yeah. Our group. So I'll see one about that is at the beginning and one that's at the end. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the beginning, uh, I think what, what we've seen is that yeah, public sector organizations themselves are still afraid to commit funding for experimentation <clears throat> so when we are able to provide funding for them it kind of works and engagement is very high mm -hmm. but if you have to assign their own organization's budget for that that becomes a huge issue um which you know just shows that kind of experimentation when it's in theory it sounds very nice but when mm -hmm. you actually need to use resources okay. mm -hmm. then it's a bit more difficult mm -hmm. But then the other bit is it's maybe similar to the one talking about, you know, what's winners and after, but it's scaling. Um, so we, through our process, we move to, to, to like pilot prototype stage. Um, and after that, more kind of usual project management uh, kind of processes start. And, and then for some, then it's a challenge to understand, like, how do you move from having a prototype to full scale solution you know people get bored with a mm. you know it's very kind of human thing um or they can't find as well like funding to scale it they don't mm. understand like how to do that mm. as and you know ensuring like long-term sustainability and impact you know you have to scale the solutions that work 
Um, so we've seen the, this as kind of like huge challenge as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in one sense, just to follow up on that, are, are you trying to in, in almost provide the first client? You know, as we, uh, um, yeah, and it's scaling for both for public sector and not. And one of our main criteria when selecting the challenge is actually the like that that other organization might have the same challenge as well. Mm. So we try to kind of incorporate sort of that mm. yeah that broader approach from the very beginning, mm. but then the all the practical questions uh, come up at the end and you know uh it, then it becomes a bit more uh, more difficult because it's not just like you know we, we can dream about uh, scaling like globally on european level but sometimes mm. it's even difficult to scale in your own organization from mm. like prototype to, to like mm. full-scale solution so yeah, and, and you hard. you have the advantage of the national level as well which is yeah. not always the case if we have a regional okay no thanks for, for those uh, insight uh bernard which what's uh the, the main barriers that you, you uh, have uh, encountered in uh, launching your uh, contester mm. ideas yeah i just was thinking um it it's very uh, maybe similar to the to the uh, things we heard now and also coming back to the questions before um, it's about how to implement then the project mm. and and the different aspects what we saw we had this uh, four uh, kind of winners and those were very in in different uh, in different areas first and then also in different size of projects when 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 I was I'm, when I'm looking at this um, we have here the electronic zoning plan which is a huge project yeah mm. Um, uh, but on the other hand, we had uh, some digitalization aspects in, in a clinic um, where it's very, it was kind of easy to, to, to launch this because it was mainly, it was before COVID. Um, so mm -hmm. the video conferences were not so common, uh, mm -hmm. especially in areas like clinics. Mm -hmm. And there setting this up was, so to say, uh, not not uh, difficult. It was easy, and it was really um, uh, a huge commitment from this uh, from this clinic, from the leader. And coming back to this, it's it's a lot. Uh, of times the commitment of yes. the of the departments so when we see that there is a commitment also from the department um, there we had a uh, very uh, huge success um, and when we saw that it's maybe not so committed from the department um, it's more dif uh, difficult and especially we had one project where we as an organization as the government um, and uh, and also uh, the health organization which belongs to us but it's a it's another organization and one project was is especially uh, in both areas and here we are still in the process on working out this pro pro uh, project and what we learned is always yeah having this really this backup always from the department and and uh, that's uh, a huge success factor and trying also to to involve them from the first beginning sometimes it's also before submitting this idea already speak mm. with them because mm. then they are aware <clears throat> and then they already um, uh, speak maybe to other uh, people and it's about the informal communication a lot like communication we had before yeah for <laughs> Frederick yeah, yeah. It sounds a bit like our peer review application process. You send it in and uh, Mark or Arnold rings you back and say, look, this might not work. Try this. And you say you construct something that you think when it actually emerges, there's a better chance of implementation. But, uh, yeah, so, yeah. but on the communication, that gives a sort of nice handy link to back to you, Frederick. The, the uh, barrier question, you know, in terms of implementing uh, the... Uh, your, your project what experience would you share with us frederick well i, I think uh, the municipalities <clears throat> here have uh, been successful with implementing uh, the services but it took some time i mean we've been doing this in since uh, 2014 mm. uh, and we're can, kind of known in sweden to to be in the front uh, with this digitization of mm. the services. So mm. um, I think the main problem for us here is the, the broadband uh, development in the sparsely populated areas. Mm. Uh, Interesting, yeah. Again, uh, mm. 
think that was one of the challenges in the Interreg Europe uh, car petition project when we, we looked at some of these issues on uh, accessibility of services and uh, this question of broadband, the, uh, the white zones. Uh, so I think uh, I don't know any of any big uh, challenges in, mm. in implementing it. Mostly but, technical, I think, with the yeah. mm. programming interfaces and sensitive personal mm. data mm. traveling around. So RGPD and uh, the other yeah, type of. Correct. Mm. Okay. My next question will not come as a surprise, given that we are in interreg Europe. Is well, have any of you been able to um, push a particular interregional dimension? And I'll give you just a few nanoseconds to think about it. Um, my, my thinking is, if you take some of the societal challenges like climate change, you know, if you put that into any one of your processes, you could say, well, we can't do much about it at the city level, we can't do much at the province level, and at Lithuanian level, maybe we can. So uh, when you think of some of the tools that, uh, you know, public procurement, uh, needs to maybe have a, a wider perspective and maybe, you know, uh, interregional, but that's just an example of a societal challenge that by, by definition is, is uh, wider than any specific geographical area. But I just wondered whether there are interregional, or in, in your country, okay, context, Aruna, international uh, scope for a corporation that you, you could share with us? Yeah, there, there definitely is. And Good. actually, just before COVID in the uh, beginning of 2020, mm -hmm. we formed together with, I think now like 20 different countries, the CIFTEC Alliance, which actually kind of groups these <clears throat> similar teams to GovTech Hub in many countries from, mm -hmm. you know, like Germany to uh, UK, Scotland, to Brazil, to Australia. Mm -hmm. And basically, even till now, we have every week calls, like sharing, you know, what what's new, what methods are Excellent. working. Mm -hmm. And together with them, we launched this uh, kind of um, CIFTEC scale-up program, mm -hmm. where we, each year we take green scale-ups. So not startups that are just <clears> starting, <throat> but more like mm -hmm. scale-ups. And then we kind of virtually tour them through all of our like member countries mm -hmm. to meet the policymakers and so on. And then in the end, when they tour through all the countries, they pitch their solutions at the COP conference. Uh, so this year it was in Egypt, COP27, before it was in Scotland. And actually, you know, after this, we had Brazil scale up, starting to work with Lithuanian uh, municipality, like transport com public company on like providing solutions. Because for, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, these like, especially green challenges, they're like so uh, universal. And we found that, through this network, we were able to bring this uh, mm. potential benefit to these startups that, you know, that otherwise, if they just message someone in like Brazil's government, mm. probably, they would not respond. We immediately kind of provide them platform mm. to get to know. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely been very useful. Excellent. If you wouldn't mind putting the link in the chat on the, on yep. the CIFTEC, that would be good. Um, I, I'll also put a link up. Um, we're aware of a, a, a European Horizon Europe uh, project called PROTECT, which is looking to uh, stimulate the SME service providers, the public authorities uh, who have a climate adaptation, climate change agenda with um, space uh, and earth observation data. From earth observation can be from the ground and from, from space in Copernicus. And it's, you know, it's, it's something we've seen in some of our interreg Europe uh, family projects where there's sort of uh, you know, with the drone technology for earth observation, I think it's aerial uptake, uh, uh, led by the city of, uh, of it's in Western, Eastern Netherlands, uh, Enschede, that's right. Uh, so aerial uptake, fix that. There was another one in, led by the Tuscany region. Uh, Arno, you may have to help me this on, on space uh, technologies, the name Stephanie. of it. St Stephanie. Stephanie, excellent, yeah. So, better memory than me for names. Uh, and, and so it, it's, a, it's a new initiative which brings together, uh, you, most number of you have said the public procurement community to use new tools. So it's one of these mission uh, statement issues. So the project's called Protect and I'll, I'll share that with you. With you. But uh, you know, thanks for that uh, insight, Darren, on the sort of interregional. I mean, that's you know one of the key issues that um, reinventing the, uh, the wheel or hot water is not 
not good. Um, I think we've got time for uh, Bernard and Frederick to answer. That's probably the last question, but if, unless our participants have got one to throw in. So, Bernard, have you got uh, any um, insights on the interregional dimension you could share with us? Um, I'm just uh, thinking about two projects, one uh, which was an outcome of our Interact Next to Met. Um, we had um, uh, seen uh, this uh, Digital Economy and Society Index, the DSE uh, report, which uh, collects data from all European uh, states and also bringing these, we thought, can we compare our region or uh, in in, in Lower Austria and also compare it to regions in other parts of Austria uh, with European uh, areas. Um, we saw that we do not have the data at the moment, but out of this came uh, that we started by uh, with our politicians, Austrian-wide discussion, and now we have uh, we, we are setting up Austrian-wide regional uh, DC index where we'd like to get out of this information, how we stand with digitalization, mm. uh, which is then the base for uh, further uh, decision and projects. Mm. So connecting also within Austria, but then another pro project we are in as a, as a government is an Horizon uh, Europe 2020 mm. project with it is called INGAF. And there we, uh, we, um, we have four uh, pilots where we are focusing on co-creation government services and here as an organization we learn a lot um, how other regions see uh, digital services um, and for our IT department also it was very helpful uh, to really get an outside view from working together with partners from other European countries because it was for them the first time and they're, they're also mm. now very proud um, uh, to, to have a European project in their IT department. Mm. At the same time, it's challenging because it's the first time to have an English speaking project um, uh, dealing with partners which they never uh, partnered up before in projects really mm -hmm. to invent a, a, a software solution. In Austria, we have a, a, a digital uh, tourism tax service, which we um, we are think, uh, focusing on. And here also mm -hmm. uh, we see how how this uh, partnering within Austria and within Europe, other other partners that we are we are really benefiting also, and we it's I, I think it's a really win-win situation, and also uh, coming together businesses and 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 also um, universities to get the different views um, when when you look at the yeah. problem statement. Yeah. So. Well, a very inspiring answer. Thanks, Bernard. Uh, Frederick. Uh, uh, an interregional uh, slash international dimension that you'd like to share with us? Uh, well, I think through these projects, we have both uh, spread our examples. I mean, we had, for example, we have a measuring system for, for garbage uh, in the households in Sundsvall, which we have, uh, you, you can see how much garbage you throw away. And mm. We have spread that through, and I think many regions have been interested in that's just one example. Uh, and I think uh, this this use of the open code, I think many have been mm -hmm. interested in also. And you've obviously got the erudite partnership that's being uh, uh, behind yes, we you. We have a lot of partnerships with different countries and regions mm -hmm. in Europe. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good thing, I think, to mm -hmm. have well. these interactions. I'm certainly glad I asked the question because I think that gave insights and opportunities for some of the participants for me to, to follow up. Um, Arnaud. All right. I think it's the time to close, Mark. Mm. I think mm. that was a, a very, very uh, interesting webinar. I mean, we, we've learned a, a lot. First, uh, this new concept for many uh, of GovTech, uh, looking at Challenges, solutions, startup, SME solution providers um, using public procurement and those um, type of challenge driven approach uh, to find uh, solutions. That was super interesting. So thank you so much, uh, Arune, for, for that. You know, digitization can be a little bit scary uh, for public servants, uh, for citizens. You know, public servants can see digitization of the public se sectors as a a threat, uh, right? And we found ways uh, with Bernard 
to empower uh, public servants also to find a solution and e-services. And with Frederick, we, we look at um, how to empower uh, civil society and citizens. So that was really, uh, really interesting as well. I don't know, Mark, if you have a last insight before we close. Yeah, I think just um, Bernard mentioned it himself then, the, you know, challenging yourself by reaching out in his case and his colleagues to Horizon Europe. Uh, we said it in the beginning, Interreg Europe PLP is about opening not only uh, the community uh, to each other, but also reaching out. And as you mentioned, I put the link to the Protect project, uh, Bernard, you'll, you'll see it's a similar thing about creating communities. As Frederick, you said, you know, sharing the ideas where you've got to create working groups, you've got to create interest groups. So I was very pleased to, to learn about these three uh, yeah, policy approaches and, and the implementation uh, challenges. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Mm -hmm. Thanks to our speakers. Uh, thanks to <coughs> our participants. I think Lotte will uh, put in the chat our survey. Um, she has already. She has already. So excellent. So you can look the survey and tell us what you think. But more importantly, what, what kind of topics would you like us to uh, address? Uh, and also, uh, we will write a very short follow-up article with a main insights um, of this of this webinar so thank you thank you everyone participants for being here mm -hmm. and uh, we hope to see you very soon at our next uh, in our next event so thank you thank you everyone thanks mark thanks, thanks. speakers thanks Sarah, Nora. Bye -bye. thank you very much and goodbye to our speakers have a good afternoon bye bye